you're welcome to um think six five four that's the econometrics for finance sections lecture six and as you can see it's um session five here but um we take it as lecture six and we're going to look at univariate time series and mod modeling and then forecasting and again my name is uh, dr lord mensa i'm on the ugbs finance department specifically and then the contact is um, Lord Mesa at ug.edu.gh. Now, the overview of the session here, we model and predict financial variables using only information contained in their own past values and possibly current and past values of an error term. So here, the information is basically within the same variable which has been measured over time for so many um, years. It could be the frequency, it could be monthly, annually, daily, or um, seconds, if you want high frequency data. Now the key topics to be covered in the sessions are as follows. We have the characteristics of um, stochastic processes. We have autoregressive pro pro processes and exponential models. And then we're going to um, demonstrate that with a view so we're going to focus in econometrics and test using e views the reading materials as usual are from chris brooks 2008 introductory econometrics for finance cambridge press second edition then we have william greens there are several of them that you can use as a supporting materials for the course Characteristics of stochastic processes where we attempt to predict. So, we talk about univariate time series models. So, here we attempt to predict returns. We talk about returns of an asset using only information contained in their past values. Now, there are some concepts that we need to accept under this. All that we're trying to say is that fine, some notations and concepts like strictly stationary process and what are, what is the criteria for strictly stationary process strictly stationary process now for a strictly stationary process all that we're trying to say is that when there is a shift in time in the series you're going to have the same distribution in the series itself so all that we repeating here is that history repeats itself so if you have the series that there's a likelihood that one of the observations will be less than B1, then when you shift time, there's a likelihood that a step forward observation will also be less than the B1. So the distribution remains the same as you move along that series. So strictly stationary probability uh, process is one where we have the probability of observing a, a particular distribution being recurrent in the series so the probability measure for the sequence yt is the same as that for ytm for each m so that's if you can see we've added t plus m so m taking what any integer so that means there's a shift in time there's a shift in time now it could be weekly stationary if a series satisfies the next three equations it is said to be what weekly stationary covariance so in the end we have expected value of the series being its mean so we have the um, expected return of the series deviation from its mean okay so the series deviation from its mean giving us what a constant and that constant is less than infinity so that tells you that the variance in the series is what constant the variance in the series is constant. Then we can also have the covariation between um, the same series and possibly its lag. And that gives us a series and its lag for each time one and then time two. That is difference in time. So it can be a time at current and then a time into the future. So if the process is covariance stationary, then all the variances are the same and all the covariances depend on what? The difference between T1 and then what? T2. So the time position determines the covariation. 
so in the end we talk about the moment so you see here we have yt deviation of it from its mean okay from its mean and then some steps ahead of the yt deviation from that from what its mean and that gives us the um, covariance function and because it's within the same series that we find that covariance we call it what autocovariance autocovariance so, however the value of the autocovariance depends on the unit of the measurement of yt so it is that's more convenient to use the autocorrelations which are the autocovariance normalized by dividing by the variance so we have the autocorrelation if we normalize the autocovariance by the variance the variance tells you that is the standard the, st the variance of the series by itself so the square deviation of the average from itself so the, we don't move any steps that's why we don't see a series so we have zero so that's uh, gamma naught so gamma s which is some steps ahead relation of the series and itself and then that of the um variance so that gives us the autocovariance denoted by tau s so if we plot tau s against s that is the number of lags or the number of leads then we obtain the autocorrelation function or what we call the correlogram now we have a process which can be purely random we realize that in the previous process we are talking about history repeating itself so that means the process is stationary so stationary my process can be purely random and if it's purely random these are the characteristics so we have a white noise process is one with no discernible structure so you, there's no pattern in that series so that's the series is purely random and a definition of for a white noise process is that it has an expectation which is mu and then it has a variance which is the constant sigma um, squared and then the only way you can find the series and then its lag relationship is through autocovariance and the autocovariance if it's between itself the series and itself then in that case we have t equals to r it becomes a constant and then any other relationship apart from that series and itself within the series it turns out to be zero that means it's purely random okay so that's the autocorrelation function will be zero apart from a single peak of what one at s equals to zero and that is where we have the um the relationship of the series by itself so yeah, it's normally distributed with mean of zero and then um, standard deviation of one over t which is the sample size being the capital t so we can use those to to do a significant test for the autocorrelation coefficient by constructing a confidence interval so if we construct a confidence interval then for example we have a 95 percent confidence interval will be given by plus or minus 0 0.196 times 1 over t square root of t and you know how this came about that's from the five percent significant level from the normal distribution table so any value that you compute as autocorrelation you just add that value and then plus or minus you just insert that value before the plus and minus and then you get the confidence interval okay so if the sample autocorrelation coefficient is tau s falls outside this region for any value of s then we reject the no hypothesis that the true value of the coefficient at lag s is zero now in the end all that we're using here is using the confidence interval approach as we stated in the previous uh, lecture series okay to determine whether a variable is significant or not we can also do a co-joint test on the autocorrelations so you have series of autocorrelations so you have a series and its lags so the first lag the series will have relationship with its first lag the series will have relationship with its second lag the series will have relationship with its um, third lag so you have several relationships how do you test them whether they are all significantly equal to zero so we can also test the joint hypothesis that all m of the tau, tau k that is 
the autocorrelations coefficient are simultaneously equal to zero using the KL statistic developed by Box and Pierce. And this is the statistics. Once you develop, you, you compute the correlations between the series and their lags, you generate several of them. So you sum them up, you multiply it by the sample size, and that will give you the kill statistics. So the kill statistics is asymptotically distributed as normal, uh, sorry, as the chi-square distribution. So you compare the value that you compute from the statistics to the chi-square distribution um, critical values from the chi square distribution table. And if the, the, the test statistics is greater than the value that you obtain from the, then it tells you that you can reject the null hypothesis that all the autocorrelations that you've computed are equal to zero. So here, however, the box and PS test has poor small sample size properties, so there was an improvement on it. And that was introduced by Loon and Box statistics and uh, in the end they just added some degree of freedom so you have t plus two times t and then they divided by an extension of the degree of freedom and still compare it to the chi-square distribution compare it to the chi -square. this statistics is very useful as a portmanteau test for linear dependence in time series so if you have a series and you want to test for the linear dependence in the series you use the box and lungs um, test now in the software these things are in there but then uh, it's just a matter of check but you need to know that exactly what goes into the computations so that when the values comes out you can relate and intuitively make some meaning out of it so that's a typical auto um, correlation function where we have the autocorrelation that was computed so the series and itself gives you one and then the first lag you get some the minus zero point that's a negative relation and then so finally by lag three you've settled on zero okay which tells you that the relationship within the series transmit and ends up at where lag two okay so by the second lag after the second lag, there's no relationship anymore. So that's the autocorrelation function as a plot. Now we have a look at what we call the autoregressive process. Now, all that we're doing here is that um, the process relate to its lags. So if you have a process which is yt, then that process will relate to its lag. So the lag one, lag two, lag three. So we're looking out for the relationship between the series and its lag. If the phi one is significant, if the phi one is significant. So within a series, it can happen like that. But over time, we realize that the relationships dies out. So those phi values, as you move along, will turn out to be approaching zero. Okay, that tells you that the relationships are dying. Now. If they turn up to be approaching zero, in case we did not find any relationship with a lag, then in the end we have mu, which is the average of the series. Okay, which is the average of the series. So, so in the end we can change the not notations as well. So if we change the notations, we're going to have we're going to replace the y t minus one by the lag y t by the lag y t and if we continue repeatedly, then yt minus i will be denoted by lag i yt. So we substitute this back into the standard equation we have up here. And you realize that the equation can be compressed to this form. And mind you, we sum it up from um, i running from 1 to p. So there's a p, that's the p order autocorrelation the P of the autocorrelation. Or we can also write it uh, generically as that form. And they seem to be the same. Okay, they seem to be the same. Or in the end, we can toss all the like terms. So all the variables that contains yt will be tossed to the other side. And then we subtract. It will be left with mu, mu 
and then ut which is the error term so this file error that you see here is nothing but a function of one minus what file one l minus and thus determines the root of the series that determines the root of the series so if the series is, has a unit root then in that case it tells you that the l has what values of one so this looks more or less like a polynomial so you can always solve for the root at the right hand side so the conditions for stationarity of any ARP, that's a P or the autoregressive model, is that the root of 1 minus 51z. You can see from here we had value. So just the z that has been replaced with what? L. Okay, in this equation where we can find the root of the equation. So the root of the equation we equate that part of the equation to zero and you all know by quadratics if you want to find the root of any equation you set what the y equals to zero so we have and all lies outside the unit root circle so a stationary model arp model is required for it to have what an ma of infinity of other infinity representation so we take an example in a simple case if you have yt equals to yt minus 1 plus yt that tells you that yt depends on its lag but then the relationship has what a root okay and the coefficient is more or less one so we're asking whether this looks like a stationary process or not now if you take out the characteristics equation in this form okay that means we'll replace this by what lag yt and then you send the lag yt to the side you have one minus l into bracket yt and that should be equal to the mu t so the characteristic has a root of so one minus l equals to what zero you get l equals to one so it is what a unit root and this tells you that it is what non-stationary okay if you repeat the process for the second case you're going to get something of like a polynomial okay which you have three roots and those are the roots okay one two over three um two and uh, since only one of them lies outside the unit root circle the process is what non-stationary okay. so you can use this characteristic equation to determine whether an equation is unit root or not we can talk about partial autocorrelation function so that see in the previous case we, we realized that oh the function will depend on its lag or true but then you can have one of its lag just popping out to have relationship without as without being dependent on the others okay other lags so the partial autocorrelation measures the correlation between an observation k k periods ago and the current observation after you have what controlled for the observations are the intermediate lags so all lags which is less than k okay so the partial autocorrelation we denoted by the tkk okay tkk measures the correlation between yt and then yt minus k where k signifies any lag that you can go so you can be lag at one lag of two lag of three so the series and what it's lag after removing the coefficient yt minus so you see we did not consider all this what lags the coefficient so it's just between yt and then what yt minus k so that is more or less like the marginal effect okay marginal effect of yt on that so at lag one the ACF equals to what? That is, the autocorrelation function is equivalent to the partial autocorrelation function at lag 1. So if you are dealing with only one lag, you have no choice than it's the same as what? The autocorrelation function. Then at lag 2, this is the relationship. But then if you increase it to lag 3, it becomes what? A bit more complex. Okay. So you can see partial autocorrelation at lag 2 is equivalent to the autocorrelation at lag 2 minus autocorrelation at lag 1 
all divided by one minus what? Autocorrelation at like one squared. Okay? But then it's quite complex when you go to the third case. Now the PSF is useful for telling the difference between an AR process and an AMA process. That is the AMA process being a combination of autoregressive process and then the moving average process. The moving average process. Now in the case of an ARP, there are direct connections between YT and then YT minus S only for a situation where we have S less than P. Now obviously S can never be greater than P, so it can only be less or equal to P. So for an ARP, the theoretical PSF will be zero after the lag P. Okay. Now in the case of MAQ, this can be written as autoregressive infinity. So there are direct connections between YT and its previous values. Okay. So for an MAQ, the theoretical PSF will be geometrically declining. Will be geometrically declining. So what is the AMA process? What is the AMA process? Now, by combining the ARP and MAQ, I didn't talk about AMAQ. MAQ tells you that YT will depend on some um, white noise only, okay? The average and the white noise only. So, all that it tells you is that if the series does not depend on its average, then the average, which is a scalar, the only series that will determine the movement of the series is the white noise, the noise in the series. And the variations in the series comes about as a result of the noise. So the AMA process, which is the autoregressive and the moving average process, is a combination of the AR and then MA. So we always talk about AMA PQ, where the AR part is of other P and then MAR MA part is of order Q. So we can obtain an what? AMA PQ model. Now, for notation purpose, we look at the auto regressive part. Okay? We look at the auto regressive part and then the MA part. Of course, this is the average. You realize that the MA part, apart from the characteristic equation, depends on what? Mu, which is the noisy part of the series. So the characteristic equation for the AR part will be determined by this function, where the other determines whether it will be quadratic, polynomial, or as the series goes, and on and on and on. And then the theta L part takes care of the MA, which is given by 1 plus sigma, sorry, theta 1 L. That's the characteristic equation that will signify that. Now, if we put the two equations together, you realize that we can split it. We have the average of the series, which is mu. Then we have a series which depends on the lags of yt up to the other p. Okay, then we can have the series for the white noise. That is for the ma part. Okay, then obviously we add mu t. Now there are some assumptions behind this extended equation. And what are the assumptions? The expected value of the mu, which is the noisy part of the series, is zero. And it makes sense that the noisy part of it varies around zero. Then we have a variance of it. Of course, if the expected value equals to zero, then the square deviation from what? The mean, okay, will be what? Will be trimmed to be expected value of mu squared t. And that is constant. That is the variance constant. And then there's no relationship between the variable, the series, that white noise series, and it's what? Like for any t not equal to what? S. So t can never be equal to S. Anytime it happens like that, then we have expected value, which is equal to zero. Okay. So if we go through the process of invertibility, then we can derive a mean of what the AMA series to be equal to mu, which is the average, divided by 
the one minus phi one phi two those are the coefficients of the series that is the ar part of the series so the autocorrelation function for an AMA process would display the combinations of the behavior derived from the AR and then the AMA part. So there are two parts coming together. But for lags beyond Q, the ACF would simply be identical to the individual ARP. So that's the time series situation. So an autoregressive process has a geometrical decaying autocorrelation function so it decays over time so the number of spikes of psf is equal to the ar order so the number of what shoots that you get in the um, autocorrelation related to the lax function that would determine the order the moving average process has a number of spikes of acf which is equal to ma order so geometrically decaying psf as well so these are some of the depictions of acf and then for psf for an ma1 so as i told you ma depends only on the noise part of the um series okay the noise part of the series so the series depends on the noisy part and what it's lag so you can see here there's kind of a decaying as a result of what approaching zero in the negative side okay that's the right bar so the red bar is the autocorrelation function and then the yellow bar is the the bars which are decaying are the partial autocorrelation functions so you can see here we have psf and p S acf and psf for an ma2 MA2 means we've gone to the lags of what two. But here you can see the bars alternating. Okay. The essence of it is as a result of the coefficient 0 0.5 and then minus 0 0.5 that we have here. Okay. Then also we have ACF and PSF for slowly decaying AR1. So here the series depends on its lag, but then the rate at which it dissipates okay the relationship reduces it's quite slow okay it's quite slow and this relationship becomes quite slow when this value which is the coefficient between this the series and its lag turns out to be fast approaching one okay so here if it's fast approaching one then we expect a unit root and if it's a unit root that means all these bars are going to be the same okay so the relationship does not die out so in the end we don't expect a stationary process there's no decay but here there's a decay but then you can see it being what slowly okay and the yellow bar here signifies partial autocorrelation that's the only well, the first lag that has a relationship and it's at 0 0.9 so you can see it from here it's 0 0.9 that will be the root of that equation And then if as you can see if we reduce the coefficient to 0 0.5 you can see the decay it's so fast okay you see a fast decay fast approaching zero and then if it turns out to be one that is non-stationary situation see all the bars are the same okay so we don't have a decay and this is a requirement when you're even doing a regression we expect that the right hand side of the equation the variables over there will be stationary if they're not stationary you have to difference them to stationarize them okay so we we expect that it will be stationary as a variable so we have combinations of psf and then acf of ama 11 this is ama 11 because we have the lax we have only one lag for the ar part and then one lag for the ac sorry for the ma part okay and of course we have the noise and this is how the series alternate this is 0 0.5 so you can see the, the decay by the time you get to this fifth lag 
you don't have any relationship anymore on the series and itself okay now how do you build this armor models there are several approaches and um box and jenkins approach that is was introduced in 1970 where the first approach the task of estimating an emma model in a systematic manner so there are three steps that they considered they considered identification of the model so you need to identify the model and then also estimate the model and then you test the model for diagnostics okay you check whether there's a significant relationship or not so the step one involves determining the order of the model so by which order should we cut the model and what criteria are we going to use to end that model the relationship and then use of graphical procedures so if you plot the data or the series are you going to see whether it's a first order or second order relationship now in step two it involves estimation of the parameters so how do you estimate those parameters are you going by OLS method? Okay. Or are you going by the maximum likelihood approach? So can be done using the least square or the maximum likelihood depending on the model. Okay. For the maximum likelihood are mostly for complex models. Okay. So then you do a model checking. How do you check the model? Do a model checking. So Box and Jenkins suggest two methods. So deliberate overfitting and then residual diagnostics for model checking. Okay. So this gives motivation for using information criteria. So if you are selecting the model, how do you go about it? You're going to have several of them. You're going to have a series that will relate to its lag up to maybe the fifth order. You're going to have a series that will relate to its lag up to the third. A series related to so which of them do you pick as your model and what criteria do you use so today we need what an information criteria okay what does this information criteria do so we have the a term which is a function of the residual sum of squares okay you know in every regression you can get what the residual sum of squares and then some penalty for adding extra parameters so you get an error term you take the standard deviation of it and then as you see we've realized that r square always increases if you keep on adding more parameters to your regression model so the objective is to choose the number of parameters which minimizes the information criteria and what goes into the information criteria the residual sum of squares and then the penalty for adding extra parameters so we have three different methods of selecting a model so we have information criteria for model selection information criteria varies according to how stiff the penalty term is and the penalty term is always the second term it's always the second term if you look at it here second term so we have the three different models the three most popular criteria are the archaics 1994 information criteria so aic and then we have the swash 1978 information criteria then we have the bayesians information criteria and then we have the hannon coin criteria now in the software you see the aic and most of the time the hannon coin um, information criteria now as we said the first part of the equation is basically the residual sum of squares then there's a penalty term which comes as a result of the parameter addition so you can see a k here that tells you that you've added the k variable at the right hand side of the equation so then we have the sample size so where k equals to p plus what k o plus what one now the p is the order of the ar part of the armor and then q is the order of the board the ma part of the armor one obviously is a constant and then we have t being the sample size we minimize the information criteria such that the 
SBIC embodies a, stiff, a stiffer penalty term than, than the AIC. Okay, so you minimize the information criteria. We minimize the information criteria. And normally, you realize that if you look at those two, the second term of the first one, and then the second term of the first, the second one, you realize that this gives what a stiffer penalty because the second term of of the SBIC is higher than the AIC. So the penalty for SBIC is higher. So in the end, it tells you that the SBIC will select models in a short term. Okay, it will select models that have relationship in a short term. So which IC information criteria should be preferred if they suggest different model orders. So SBIC is strongly consistent but inefficient. And then AIC is not consistent and will typically pick bigger models. So if we're going to the four, if AI, AIC picks the fifth order, SBIC will pick the second order. Okay, it will pick the second order. As a distinction from ARMA models, we can introduce a further model which we call the ARIMA models. The ARIMA models. And the I stands for um, integrated model. So an integrated autoregressive process is one with characteristic root on the unit circle. So typically, all that you're going to do is to difference the variables as necessary and then build an ARIMA, sorry, an AMA model on those different variables. So if you difference the variable once, then it becomes ARIMA one one. If it differences twice, then the I becomes what two. Okay. So the variables and you know how to, to how to take difference of a variable. We deal, we dealt with that in the earlier um, lecture. So an AMA PQ model in the variable difference D times D what times is equivalent to an ARIMA PDQ. So the D is just what the difference in the variables. So if, if I run um, an AMA model on first difference of the variables, then I'm going to have what? ARIMA P1 Q, depending on what? The AMA P or the Q that I'm going to choose for the model. So that's the end of the first bit of the series. But the next series, we're looking at the forecasting in econometric and test using e-views. So forecasting econometrics and test using e-views. Now forecasting synonymously means what? Prediction. Okay. It means you are predicting. So an important test of the adequacy of a model forecasting tomorrow's return on a particular share. And then forecasting the price of a house given its characteristics. Then also forecasting the riskiness of a portfolio over the next year. They're forecasting the volatility of bond returns. And we can distinguish between the two approaches. So we can have the econometric structural approach forecasting. That's what we did. We established a model where we regress one variable on the other. Then if we want to go into the future, we can forecast with that structure model. So it's all about T, 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 T. So then we can do time series forecasting as well. So we forecast on over time. We are here today. We can forecast into the future. It could be a macro variables. It could be returns on asset and all those. And then also distinguish between the two types is somewhat bled if we are dealing with VAR models vector autoregressive model. Now the vector autoregressive models involves some structural equations at the same time, time series equations. So the combinations, if you want to distinguish between the structural forecasting and then time series forecasting, it becomes difficult. So we'll come to the vector autoregressive models in our next few lectures. You will see the structure of those type of equations. Now if you are forecasting, you have to forecast, you see, you have a series. Now, if you want to forecast, the series has to be 
able to focus within itself before you move out of the series. So we have in sample versus what? Out of sample forecasting. So the expect the forecast of the model to be what? Good in sample. So we expect that the forecast of the model will be what? Good in sample. So if we have some data, monthly Ghana stock exchange return for um, 120 months. So we're looking at a month 1990, month one to 1999, December, which is month 12. We could use all of it to build the model or keep some observations back. We use it to forecast. So look at how we split the data. Within the sample, we can use January 1992, December 1998 to build a model. Okay. Then we forecast out of sample within the model, the data. Okay. Then if it happens that we have a very close values in relation to our forecast to the actuals, then we can move out of sample. Okay. So this is how the um, data can be used to forecast. So we have the in sample estimation period, and then we have out of sample forecast evaluation period. So here, you have, if not exhausted the data, you use part of the data for the estimation. You forecast beyond that estimation period. You relate it to the actuals in that period in your data. Then you are sure of the model because here you are going to test whether there is a difference between your forecasted values and then the actuals. Then if you, min you find a minimum value or you find a reduced error, you can go out of sample. Okay. You can go out of sample. And a good test of the model, since we have not used the information from 1999, month one, onwards when we estimate the model parameters. How, so how do we produce forecast? We can move multi-step ahead or we can do a single um, step forecast or we can do recursive rolling windows recursive rolling windows so we'll come to that you see how the windows are rolled now to understand how to construct forecast we need the idea of conditional expectation so the expected value of yt into the future given some information the information always ends at t because your data is always behind you that means we are we are expecting some value into the future the size one step ahead that's why you see one and then depending on what some information we have prior. so if we don't have any information April, we can what forecast into the future so we cannot forecast the white noise process because if you look at the expected value of this given the information it's always equal to zero so we don't have any clue of what is going to happen in the future for a case of white noise. So for each S greater than what? Zero. And the two simplest naive forecasting methods are one, assume no change. So naively, if you want to forecast a series, all that you're going to say that is that the future value, the forecast value of YT plus S, S can take one, two, three, four, five does not change from the current value. So that's a naive way of saying it's not going to change. So if you want to forecast the weather today, tomorrow, it going, it's going to repeat today's weather. Okay? So that's a naive way of what? Forecasting. So assume no change. And then you can say that forecasts are the long-term average. So if we have a series, then the best forecast into the future is what? The average of the series. So nothing will happen apart from the average. Okay. So if we are going to use our structural models to forecast, so you remember our regression model can be compressed in that form, we can expand it into that. That is yt equals to b1, which is the constant, and then all the coefficients for x2, t2, skt. So to forecast y, Focus Y will require the conditional expectations of its 
future value. So we're trying to establish something here. So if we want to forecast why, we affect the expectation operator. And mind you, the expectation operator is linear. Okay, so we have a linear expected value of that, giving some information behind at a lag. Then this is a constant. So when you take the average of a constant, you still get what? A constant. Now here we take the average. So in the end, you realize that the expected value of yt would depend on what? This is the average of what x to t, the average of the, would depend on the averages of all the series. So if we look at the expectation and we have the coefficient, we can take the expected values of the independent variables. We multiply them by the coefficient. That will be the average of the series. So that's a way of using the structural model to forecast. Now let's come to the time series way of forecasting. Now the current value of yt is modeled as a function only of its previous values. And the current value of an error term, okay, and yeah, so it combines the previous values and some error term. So, and possibly previous values of the error term. So the models include simple unweighted averages. So now, if we compute average, all that we do in is what? We sum and then we divide by the number of observations. In the end, if you sum and divide by the number of observations, you are just giving them equal weight. The, that you tell me that all the individual observations have what? The same impact on the average. But then you can do weighted average as well, where the observations will contribute probably in terms of their mag magnitude onto the average. So that's what we call the weighted average. And then we have the exponentially weighted average. So if you have a series which ends at, let's say, a period T. Now, you started from 1991, and then you ended at 1999. You realize that what is going to happen in 2000 will depend more on 1999 observations will have more influence on 2000 than 1991. Because 1991 is far away. So if you have a series that loses memory, okay, over time, then you're talking about what? 1990 not having influence on, less influence, having, having less influence on 2000 than 1999, okay? So you can do exponentially weighted average. Then you can also focus with ARIMA models, and then you can have nonlinear models as well, which will come into, in our future um, lecture series, we're going to have the GASH, models and then the bilinear models in the end. You can also forecast with an armor model. No? An arm, MAQ only has what the memory of Q. So it means the relationship goes after Q. So as you can see, if we take MA3, we can have the series being of that form. Realize that the series depends on the average and then what? Some noise. Okay. But the noise has what some lags okay. and then if you shift the time forward you see that we have plus one and then minus one okay so plus one that will be t and then plus one that will be t t minus one so we keep on shifting the time forward in all the series and we we are at a time t and we want to what forecast one two up to s steps ahead so we know yt yt minus one and then and then and then mu t and then mu t minus one so here we forecast the expected returns and then the same uh, moving average series which depends on mean and some white noise okay and so if you affect the expectation here is constant so it's the same expectation now if you affect um, expectation on a mu one and this will come out and you have what mu one expected value and then it goes on and on so you end up having a series of this form now why would a series not have um, we have sigma so this tells you that the series is ending at where mu t plus one so anything beyond where the sample ends it will be zero so this part will be zero and it, we, we apply the same principle in the second step forecast, the same principle in the third forecast.
forecast. Now I realize that as we come down, the equation keeps on shrinking and shrinking. So in the end, for a moving average, if you want to forecast into the future, MA infinity will be the average of the series. So you realize that the first case you have a long equation, the second case you have a long equation, but you, you've lost one term, okay, in the second case. And then you come, you, you have, you've lost another term. And then finally, you have only the average. So that tells you that if we move S steps ahead, the best forecast, if it's a moving average, is what? The average. For each word, S greater than 4. So if you have a moving average, which is 3 of other 3, the best forecast is the average. If you go beyond the third position or the third lag, okay, if you go beyond the third lag. We can also do the same for an AR. An AR, if we take the AR model itself, you'll see that it's a series that depends on the average and some lags and then some noise. Some noise. And then we take one step forward, okay, two steps forward, three steps forward. So the forecast will affect the expected value of that. And as you can see here, we have the mu plus phi 1 t y t plus phi t minus t. And it goes on and on. For the second case, we have the same principle. And then in the third case, so we can see immediately that as you move st more steps ahead, we are talking about a forecast at the third position and then the forecast at the, the second position. So if we want to generalize it, if we have S steps forecast for any AR, we are talking about the forecast in the previous value, which is what? In the case of four, you have three here. And then in the case, yeah, so you have two here. So S minus two, okay? So we can easily generate what? An AMA PQ model using the same principle. Okay. Same principle. So this tells you that for an AR, if you're able to forecast up to the S, S position, all that you have to do is to take the average, and input the previous forecast, and then forecast before. Okay, That will give you the forecast S steps ahead. So how can we test whether a forecast is accurate or not? That's the question. We do forecast it. How do we test whether it's accurate or not? For example, we say we predict that tomorrow's return on the GSC will be 0 0.2, but the outcome is actually minus 0 0.4. Okay, minus 0 0.4. So that's that's our forecast. Okay, but then there was a realization after the forecast that gives us what minus 0 0.4, and is this accurate? Define FTS as the forecast made at the time T for S steps ahead. The forecast made for time T plus 1. So we denote and Y T plus 1 as the realized value of Y at time T plus 1. So there's a difference between what you forecast and what you realized in the future. So we try to minimize that margin of error. Okay. So, some of the most popular criteria for assessing the accuracy of time, of time series forecasting technique is the mean square error approach, the mean square error approach. All that it does is that it takes the difference between the actual realization and your forecast. So, it's like you are computing the variance, okay, between the actual and then what? The forecast. Then you divide by the number of what observations. Then we have the mean absolute error. Now the caveat in this is that it doesn't dissociate between the um, positive and negatives. And then in the end, when you square it, it blows the values up. Okay. So there was an improvement. Some people are saying, why don't we use the absolute values? So even if we take the difference, and it happens that the forecast is higher than the actual which will give us negative value, then we can what, take the absolute value. Okay, so instead of blowing the values up, we can what, reduce the values. And then we have the mean absolute error. Then we have the mean absolute percentage error. That, that's how it goes. So 
you have the actual minus the forecast divided by what so what fraction of the difference pertains in the actual times what 100 okay so that's criteria for um, testing whether your forecast is accurate or not now it has however been shown that by Gallo and Etta 1993 that the accuracy of forecast according to the traditional statistical criteria are not related to trading profitability so they introduce a different measure called the correct sign prediction the correct sign prediction this variable z that you see here is kind of indicator function which gives you a value if the product of your actual and the forecast is greater than what one it gives you a value of one otherwise it's what zero so if the forecast and then the um the only time you can get the forecast and then the actual giving you greater than zero is when both are positive and then when both are what negative okay so if both are negative right at the right hand side of the number line okay they are positive at the right hand side of the number line then it means they are close isn't it so it gives you an indicator indication of one and then if they turn out to be zero that is one is lying at the negative side one is lying at the positive side then it gives you what an indication of what zero so you sum all those relationships up so you get one zero one zero you're going to sum them up and then you divide it by the number of what samples okay the number of samples so let's take an example given the following forecast and actual values calculated Calculate the MSC, that's the means absolute error, and then percentage correct sign predictions for this information. Now, this is your forecast, and that is what your actuals. Okay, so the MSC, if you go through the process, is what 0 0.079, which is fast approaching zero. So it minimizes, it tells you that the, the difference between your actual and the forecast is somehow smaller. Okay. And then that of MAE is 0 0.1. Okay, mean mean absolute error 0 0.1. And then the correct sign prediction is what? 40 percent. Okay. Why is it 40 percent? You realize that this correct sign prediction says that if both the actual and then the, 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 the product of the actual and the forecast is is greater than zero, okay then it will be one okay otherwise it will be zero and i told you that anytime you have both numbers being positive okay the forecast and then what the actual being positive that's when you get greater than zero or if both of them are negatives that's when you get what greater than zero so if you look at here you realize that you have both positives okay the actual and then both positives none of them will be negative negative okay so we have two over five because you're going to have one here will be what if you look at a percentage of correct signs the first case will be zero okay the second case will be one the third case will be one then the second case will be zero zero so you have two over five times hundred so that gives you the forty percent okay so the process this is how you get a mean squared error and then the mean absolute error it's clear okay compute the values okay so statistical size, size versus economic financial loss function so statistical evaluation metrics may be may not be appropriate so how well does a forecast perform in doing the job we wanted it to do how well so maybe you, you've established a model but the model might not be correct so what do you do so there are limits with forecasting so what and what can and cannot be forecast so you look at this all statistical forecasting models are essentially extrapolative so they moved into the future based on what the information within the data okay based on the information within the data and forecasting models are prone to break down around turning points so if you have a data that is not continuous but breaks along the line then it becomes what the it becomes a problem when you want to forecast 
And we studied this under um, the, the first lecture where I mentioned that you have to make sure that you test for the stability in your coefficient. And if you're testing for stability in your coefficient, then in the end, if the coefficient is stable, then you can rely on your forecast. But if the coefficient turns out not be, to be stable, then you know the forecasting breaks down. It means there's a turning point in your series. There's a turning point in your series. Now, series subject to structural changes or regime shift cannot be what? Forecast. Of course, they go hand in hand. The first case and the second case go hand, hand, goes hand in hand. And then predictive accuracy usually declines with forecasting horizon. So the deeper you go into the future, the more you lose accuracy the more you lose accuracy. And forecasting is not a substitute for judgment. Forecasting is not a substitute for judgment. Of course, judgment comes with its own um, weakness. So if someone is judging without necessarily going by empirics, then he's likely to be what? Overconfidence. Okay? He's likely to be overconfidence. So why not use expert to make judgment instead of forecast? So you can go to the ministries when it comes to um, macro forecasting. They can tell you that, hey, we have been here for so many years. And this is how the figures will look like. And this is how it will look like into the future. Or any time we have this environment playing a role or this type of situations happening, there's likelihood that we're going to have our GDP growth to be like this. So those people can be judgmental. So judgmental forecast brings different set of problems. And Psychologists have found that experts' judgment are prone to the following biases. So you either be overconfident, you're going to be inconsistent, and you're going to draw more on recent information, so more of what recency, okay? And then also illusory patterns, patterns that does not exist, imaginary patterns, and then sometimes the thinking group, this one has said this, he's also going to say the same thing, okay? So, so usually the best way to go about it is to combine forecasting with what? Judgment. To combine forecasting with, with judgment. So the essence of modeling is to forecast. And if you're able to forecast, you can add judgment to it. So the, usually, the usual um, optimal approach is to use a statistical forecasting model built on solid theoretical foundations and supplemented by expert judgment and interpretations. Expert judgment. And interpretations. Now we can demonstrate all this in eView. So I go back to my screen and then demonstrate on how you can use eViews to forecast how you can estimate autocorrelation coefficient for up to 12 lakhs. Okay. Up to 12 lakhs. So we're going to use a data on monthly US houses series which was already incorporated in an eViews work file that we did. And then running from February 1991 to May 2007 for percentage change in house series. And then double click on the series, eViews, and on the process, view the chorelogram, how the relationships within the series decay over time. And then the chorelogram specification window, choose levels, and then in the lags to include box type 12 okay so i'll demonstrate that on the screen here as you can see i minimize um, my powerpoint slice and then open eviews from desktop okay so eviews was installed some time ago um right so the eviews is open now uh, the type of data I'm going to use, let me go back to desktop again, where I have uh, this UK housing prices. Okay, so I have to import the data. But before I import the data, as usual, we have to create a work file for it. So new and then work file. Now, this data I'm talking of is, um, let me see, is it monthly? It's monthly data, right? So I change the frequency to monthly again. And then it start from what? January 1991. So I will type 991, okay, um, double dot, zero 01. And then we have the end date of the data. I open it because I, can, I want to peep through and see the start and the end date of the data. So the end date is May 
2007, right? Okay, May 2007, which is 2007, and the fifth month, right? Fifth month. So that's my work file created. So I want to import the data into that work file. Okay, so it's on my desktop. Where is the location? Uh, yeah, uh, it's in the folder called Econometrics for Finance. And then uh, UK house prices. So open, that's the data, okay. So I go to next, it's a monthly, the frequency has been indicated there. And then I want the first lines to be names. Okay, so I go on and then uh, finish. Okay, click on it to check if I have my data. So that's the data I'm going to use, okay. That's the data I'm going to use. Now, if you look at my slides carefully, the instructions are well spelled clearly. So we estimate the autocorrelation coefficient for up to 12 lakh. So for example, uses UK prices series, which was already incorporated, running from that, that, that percentage in houses. So double click on the HDHP series and then choose view. So the house prices, I'll double click on it. Do I have that series? Okay, so I have a double click. They said go to view and then um, we go to Corologram. And then do you want to do the Corologram on the first difference? Do you want to do the Corologram on the first difference? Okay, that means, um, yeah. On the first difference or you want to do it on the second difference or in levels now they said 12 lakh so lakhs to be included at 12 okay so i click on okay what do you see here you see that what the autocorrelation is decaying by the 12 lakh it has not finished decaying you see all the kill statistics they seem to be highly significant okay and the coefficient are fast approaching one all right so let me try it on the um, on the first difference and see where it will. So if you look at the first difference, on the first difference. Now here, what do you see? As you move along, you realize that even for the partial autocorrelation, by the third one, you realize that all the variables are no more significant, isn't it? All the variables are reducing, fast reducing to zero. And here you see a decay but it picks up again okay so normally that is how the corollogram will look like if you talk about so let me open it up for you to see how the whole thing looks like so i can restore i can restore the image and then that is how it looks like so this is a way of what checking whether the series depends on itself so the series depends on itself so let's go to the second, the next slide. So this is the window we just saw, okay? That's the window we just saw from the, um, yeah, that's the window, okay? So that's an indication of your outcome. So if you add 12 lakh, so by the third lakh, you're already fast reducing to zero. So now how do you, um, pick an AMA model in eView. So you look at the instructions. It says that um, estimating AMA model in eViews, in eViews, and then information criteria for deciding which order to use. Example of AMA 11 on the eViews main menu. Click on quick and choose estimate equation. So, and then eViews will open an equation specification window in the equation specification window you type um, the equation window so you want you testing the armor on the difference between the house prices in the UK and you want to specify AR1 and AMA1 for the estimation settings select the least squares and then select the whole sample and click on OK this will specify an armor model. The output is given in the table 
in the next um, slide. Coming back to my um, e views, I go to quick and then estimate equations. And then in the equation estimation model, I go by D in a bracket H, P, sorry, um, average. So the, the data we have there is average. And uh, let me give it a simple name before um, I do the estimation. So that window, so I, I can just uh, rename this one and say rename and give it um, UK um, house prices. So HP and then, um, okay, so HP will be displayed. It's just a renaming, okay, it's just a renaming. So I go to view. I go to quick. What has happened to my data? So quick, and then estimate the equation. I go. I take a difference of the data. So D of HP, HP, and then is there a C? Let me go back to the slide to see. Yeah, there's a C, and then AR one. And then MA one. Okay. So click on OK. So this is the estimate. So you can see the dependent variable is the house prices. Okay. Is the house prices. And the independent we have ar1 and then ama1 and you can see that you have the standard errors okay you have the t statuses and the ar1 ama1 they all show very good signs of what significance okay and that can be confirmed from their p values and then look at the f statuses value okay the r square is quite okay okay so that is how you can estimate from the ama model and we expect to see that in the slides. So that is the um, the estimate of the AMA model from the difference of the house prices. The difference of the house prices. They all show very good signs of significance in their coefficient. Okay, in their coefficient. Okay, so you can repeat the steps. So we've specified AMA one one. Okay. That's AMA 1.1. One, one. And then you can repeat the other AMA models would give all of the required values for the information criteria. So to, and then you can see from the table, from the uh, results, the information criteria is there, or you don't see it. Uh -huh. So you can see different types of what? Information criteria, the SWAS, archaics, the Han and Quinn. Okay. They are all in here. So you can copy them. And then you repeat the process for the other models of AMA. So you can do that of AR1, ARP. So you can take one to five and then you perm them. Okay. You do various combinations in pairs. And then they will generate a nice table. And then out of the table, you can pick the best one that is giving you the minimum criteria, the minimum um, information criteria. And as you can see here, if you are using AIC, if you are using AIC, AIC picks the value, it picks a, a model of um, AMA 4, 4, okay? That's the most minimum that you can get if you do all the combinations, okay? So the values of all the information criteria calculated using EVUs are in the side table. So this is the side table. So which model actually minimizes the two criteria? Okay. And you can see for AIC it picks what? AMA 44. And in this case, the criteria chooses different models. So AIC select AMA 44. And while SBIC select AMA 20. That is the same as AR2. Okay. That's the same as AR2. That's the most minimum of all the criteria. And you, as you can see from here, the 
a s b i c because it allows for what higher penalty for adding more variables it always picks the lowest model okay picks the lowest model and as we depicted in the theory so suppose that the ar2 model selected for the house price percentage changes series were estimated using the observations from february 1991 to december 2007 you realize that we didn't use sorry we used what data from 1991 to um 2007 okay but here part of it will be used and the part of it will be used for the forecast so leaving 29 remaining observations to construct a forecast for for and to test the forecast accuracy so the rest of the data which is from january 2005 to 20 may 2007 will be used for the forecasting so once the required model has been estimated which is ar2 earlier on and if use has opened a window displaying the output click on the forecast icon so once the required model has been estimated and then if use has opened a window displaying the output click on the forecast icon and in this instance the sample range to forecast will of course be um six one six nine to one nine seven and so we change the time okay which should be entered as 2005 to january to 2007 may so as usual we go back to our e-views so we click on the forecasting icon and you can see uh, where are we forecasting um, we're forecasting from 2005 january so we change this place to 2005 2005 january so we have january and then we click on okay so we have different types of uh, forecasting we can have the dynamic forecasting and then the static forecasting so if i click on okay this is the window that we expect to see and you can see as the forecast and with their confidence interval so plus or two plus or minus two standard errors so this is the for actual forecast so we can rely on this and then predict into the future so how different is this from the actual um, values and you can see from here we have the bias proportion that is the number of observations that are biased and then we have the variance proportion so the variations in the proportions and then the covariance proportions so in the end that is the forecast and then we expect to see this um, window there are two methods available in e views we have the uh, dynamic and static forecast okay so select the option dynamic to calculate the multiple multi-step forecast from the first period in the forecast sample and then the static to calculate the sequence of one step forecast rolling window so you're going to roll forward step by step so the output for the dynamic and static forecast are given in the diagram in the next slide so we have the dynamic this is the dynamic forecast depiction as you can see from there we have the um the various um criteria that you can use to detect whether the model is right or not so we have the root mean squared error we have the mean absolute error then we have the tau case inequality that takes the difference so the bias proportions of bias you see the proportion of bias is a very small number so we're looking at a very good um, accurate forecast here and then if you use um, the um, dynamic which you roll every month this is how the forecast will look like so look at the actual forecast and then the confidence band and that is plus or minus two the standard errors and again you can see the bias proportion being very small number so in summary all that we've done we've got to know the definition of a white noise process and then also what an autoregressive process is which you can estimate it in uh, e views and there are two approaches to financial modeling econometric forecasting and then time series forecasting that's all that we've done 
for this lecture series. Thank you very much for your time.